Well, not all artists liked either neoclassicism or romanticism. There were some artists who just felt that that's not what art should be. That art should refer to the material world and it should be about the contemporary society of ordinary people. And that is the art movement we call realism. Now, some realist artwork implies a social comment. Not all of it, but sometimes. So there it is, in short, material world, contemporary society, ordinary people, and sometimes a social comment. We're going to talk about two realist painters. Both are French. Uh, the first one is Gustave Courbet. And I'm going to use a quote uh, from Courbet. It's something that I feel sums up the realist concept um, and tells you what he was trying to do with art. And Courbet says, show me an angel and I'll paint one. Now, what does he mean by that? Show me an angel and I'll paint one. Well, he's never seen an angel. He paints the material world around him. So he said, if you want me to paint an angel, you'll have to show me one and then I'll paint it. But I've never seen an angel, and so I'm not gonna paint one. This work by Courbet, it's called The Stonebreakers, and it was painted in 1849. Um, this work no longer exists. Uh, it was destroyed during the firebombing of Dresden, but as you can see, they did take color photographs. So we have um, a photograph of it. And what we're looking at is poor working class men who are very hard at physical labor. Uh, what they're doing is breaking up stones to make gravel. And, you know, it's just very hard work. As you can see, they're very poor. Uh, their clothes uh, are tattered. Um, they've got patches on them. Um, and you can see that the older man has sabo. Uh, he has these wooden shoes uh, that is what the peasants would wear. We don't see the faces of either of these. The lower part of the face uh, for the older man, but his face is shaded with the hat. Uh, the younger man turns away from us. So they're not really individuals, but they give us this feeling of the whole class of people um, who labor and don't reap great rewards for their hard physical labor. Now, is this a social comment? I think to a lot of people it would be. Um, you know, it, it has sympathy for these people. At the same time, it's a very realistic image of contemporary life. So there may be an implied social comment, or some people just might look at this and, and not see it. This is a very large painting. It's nine feet, and that's significant. Uh, the name of it is A Burial at Ornans, or A Funeral at Ornans. Uh, Ornans was the little village from where Corbet came. And what you're looking at is the funeral of his grandfather. And as you can see, um, the body has been buried. You can see a little bit of the grave at the bottom. Uh, and it looks like the ceremony at the graveside is almost over. Uh, the priest uh, is about to uh, close his missal. Uh, some of the mourners are starting to leave. Uh, one thing that's often said about this painting is that the people are lined up democratically. Uh, in other words, there's no emphasis on uh, a very important or a heroic figure. Uh, for example, the emphasis isn't on the priest or the chief mourner or um, some kind of composition that leads to a, a pinnacle. 
Uh, it's just basically rows of people. Now, this painting became controversial because of its huge scale. There's nothing wrong in painting a village funeral. It's a genre scene. It's, you know, ordinary people, something that could happen to anybody. But Corbet chose to make, but Corbet chose to make this painting nine feet wide, a huge scale. And that's usually reserved for history paintings with lofty themes, allegories, mythologies, you know, important subjects. Genre painting would usually be smaller. But when he creates this large scale painting for essentially a, an everyday subject, he's claiming that that, the material world of ordinary people, is just as important as a mythological scene or an allegory or a religious subject. So he's claiming the scale and the importance for realism, for contemporary life. Now, this is a funeral, but it is showing the material world. It's not showing supernatural beings coming down for the funeral. Uh, it doesn't show you angels hovering overhead. Uh, there is a reference to religion, but that is simply you know, what the priest, the acolytes, uh, and the crucifix. But the crucifix is not uh, supernatural here. It's probably a wooden crucifix that exists within the physical world. So I want to contrast that to a 16th century burial scene. Uh, and this is El Greco's burial of Count Orgaz. Now, uh, Count Orgaz was actually a 14th century count. He was supposed to be very holy. And in the 16th century, 1586, uh, El Greco is painting him uh, in 16th century clothes, uh, 16th century armor. And behind him uh, are rows of contemporary people in uh, contemporary clothing. Now, who's El Greco? El Greco is an artist whose name was Domenico Theotiacopoulos. And he was born in Crete, uh, an island off Greece. Uh, he was in Italy for a while. Uh, he possibly was influenced by uh, Venetian artists like Tintoretto with the loose brushwork and elongated figures. And then he moved to Spain. And in Spain, they probably couldn't say Theotokopoulos. <laughs> so they gave him a nickname. They called him El Greco, the Greek. He's very well known for his extremely elongated figures and very free, fluid brushwork. In this painting, he's showing a burial. Uh, the count is being laid to rest by two saints. On the left is Saint Stephen, the first Christian martyr. So he's from the first century. Uh, holding the head of the count is the bishop Saint Augustine of Hippo, who was um, who lived in the fourth and fifth centuries. So these are saints who have come down from heaven to help bury the count, and half the painting is taken up with heaven. You can see an angel rising up, holding this amorphous human-shaped form in his arms. And so this is the angel carrying the soul of the count up to heaven, where we see Christ, Mary, John the Baptist, uh, other saints, and angels in heaven. So this is definitely a burial with angels and with supernatural uh, beings. But Corbet says, show me an angel and I will paint one. And he's never seen an angel. He does not paint the angels. There is no supernatural component uh, to Corbet's 
burial at Orens. The second realist artist we're going to look at uh, is Honoré Daumier. Now, he was both a painter and a printmaker. He's probably even better known for his printmaking. And we're going to look at uh, a new medium, something we haven't discussed before, uh, lithography. But first, we're going to look at one of Daumier's paintings. This is a third class carriage. Essentially, it's a picture of urban life, of the ordinary people, the poor people, in the cheapest section of the, of the bus or the train. Um, there were three different classes. Um, the comfortable first class and uh, sort of in the middle second class, and then the hard seats where people are pushed close together. Uh, this is the third class carriage. And so here are the common, ordinary people in the cheap seats. Uh, I think Daumier's style is very interesting because when you look at this, he combines linear and painterly. He has this very free, expressive line. He's one of the great draftspersons of the uh, 19th century. Uh, and very free, fluid line, it's, it's painted. And then he has loose brushwork. In fact, in some places, it almost seems to be a wash of color. But he's particularly known as a printmaker. Um, his job was to paint uh, what we would today call political cartoons. Uh, or, and these were both political and social satires. They were generally published in opposition journals. That's uh, journals that, and newspapers that came out in opposition to the government. And sometimes they were suppressed. Uh, most of his work can be seen as protest art, uh, either protests against things in society or in politics. But he does combine both very serious work and sometimes very humorous work. So I'm going to show you an example of each. The technique he uses is lithography. Now the word litho means stone in Greek. And so this was originally made on a special kind of Bavarian limestone. Today, they will call things lithography, such as photolithography, uh, that do not use a stone. But we're going to talk about the original way that lithographs were created. Uh, here you see the printing of a lithograph, and you have the stone uh, which has been inked, and the paper is, is on it, and uh, there would be a housing to this press. It's uh, just showing with its essential elements here. But a scraper would pass over and press the paper against the block and pick up the ink. You don't have to press the paper down into any grooves because there aren't any grooves. So how do you create a lithograph? Well, you would use a greasy crown. We talk about litho crown, so a greasy or oily uh, stylus. And you would draw your drawing on the limestone. And then you apply a very weak acid solution to the surface of the stone. Now, every place that is covered by the greasy drawing is impervious to the acid. But wherever the drawing is not, the acid can make the stone porous. So it bites into the stone a little bit. And then you clean off the acid, you clean off the drawing. Then you apply water to the surface of the stone and the water soaks into the porous stone. But the areas that were covered with the drawing are impervious to the water, it just beads up and does not soak in. Then you roll on an oil-based ink. Just take a roller, a brayer, and just roll that ink across it. Everywhere 
the water is in the stone, it repels the ink. But the ink adheres to the part of the stone that had been covered with the drawing. So what you get is a very close reproduction of the original drawing. And because you're not pressing the plate down with every time it goes through the press, you can print thousands of copies. So this was used for commercial art in the 19th century. It was used uh, for illustrations in newspapers, in periodicals, and they also used it for posters. And you can do color lithographs where uh, you would have uh, stones of the same size and you would have the uh, different parts of the drawing. Each one would be uh, you know, the area where you'll put the different colored ink and uh, then you would print each one on top of each other and you would have a poster that would be colored. We're going to look at Daumier's lithograph of the Rue Transnoin. Now, Rue just means street, so this is Transnoin Street. And just as sometimes we'll mention a place name and it reminds us of the event that occurred, you know, we'll say Watergate, and people don't say, oh, what a lovely hotel. They'll think about um, Nixon and um, the uh, chicanery that went on uh, trying to steal political secrets. Or you'll say Hirosh Hiroshima, and you'll think of the bombing, the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. So when you say Rue Transnoin, it's referring to the event that occurred. This is very much a political protest. During the 19th century, there were many periods of unrest in Paris and in France. And this refers to an event when the French soldiers were patrolling the streets and a sniper fired on them from a tenement house. Now this is an apartment building where many poor working class people live and it was at night. The people were asleep after working hard all day. And the French soldiers went into the apartment house, pulled people out of bed, killed them. Uh, they killed children. They just wiped out whole families who had obviously had nothing to do with the sniper. So this lithograph was made in opposition, um, and for one of the opposition journals. Um, it was supposed to be distributed en masse, uh, but the government suppressed the print. They tried to gather them up and destroy them. Obviously, they didn't succeed because we still have uh, some copies of this print, and it's very well known. Let's look at some of the stylistic elements and then talk more about uh, the content and the impact. You can see tenebrism here. You know, the edges are dark, and it's as though there was uh, a window uh, up above the, where the print is, and the light is coming in and shining on the bed and the man. And the bedclothes are pulled down in a diagonal. And then this, this man is just sprawled out uh, and foreshortened. So you've got the dramatic diagonal, but of course, they're dead. There's not really movement. So it's implying a kind of drama. And I always think of this as the morning's light shows what the night's work has been. You know, as though you know the sun's come up and now it's illuminating this tragedy. When a disaster or some mass killing occurs, we hear numbers. You know, the press reports, you know, so many hundreds, so many thousand were killed. But we're human. We have trouble getting around we have trouble getting our minds around those numbers. And so one of the things that often happens is the press will then tell the story of individual victims. I remember after 9-11, um, Newsweek 
came out with an issue in which they had picked certain people who had been killed at 9-11. And they told their stories and the impact of their death on their family. And one that stood out to me was one of the poor people. Um, and he was supporting his family. And the impact you know, on the family. You think, well, why would anyone kill someone like that? So that's what Domier has done. Instead of trying to show you a picture of the apartment house with you know, many, many bodies around, he's shown you one family and what happened to them. Now, he didn't go there and draw the bodies. He, he wouldn't have been allowed. Uh, the government was trying to hush this up. So he has to imagine it. But what he shows is one family who has been slaughtered. And, you know, they're ordinary looking people. They're not idealized. We can really sympathize with these people. And we can be outraged that anyone would have killed them for no reason at all, for nothing they had done. So we see the man in his nightshirt. And he's, you know, just so obviously been pulled right out of bed. You know, he was not the sniper. You see, of course, it's black and white and gray, but you see where he's been shot. Uh, this blood, you know, coming from his chest. And he's just lying in very undignified pose. And beneath him is his child. And you see the blood coming from the child's head and blood pooling underneath the child. And you wonder, did he try to protect his child? Uh, and that's why he's fallen on him because he was standing in front or that they, was the, you know, they wouldn't have had a lot of space. Uh, some people live many generations in one room um, where they all in bed uh, and the child was there and he was just pulled out with him. But anyway, they, they killed this, this toddler. And then you see the head of an old man. Was this the father? You know, maybe prematurely old because uh, he's had such a hard life, or possibly even the grandfather. Uh, and then the man's wife is over here, just sort of discarded uh, in the shadow. Um, you know, this this working woman. And so it it brings the tragedy to us because you feel this sympathy and this horror and you know if it could happen to them it could happen to anyone okay i promised you a little humor too domier often uh creates satires that uh, are quite humorous uh and this one's called the battle of the schools now they're not talking about educational institutions, schools. By schools, they mean schools of art in the sense of groups of artists, the art movements. Uh, they could have called this the battle of the art movements. And what you're seeing is a mock heroic battle between the grubby little realist and the neoclassical academician. So on the left is the grubby realist, and he's so poor he can't even afford clothes that fit, so he's wearing clothes that are much too small for him. Um, he's wearing wooden shoes, sabots, on his feet. Uh, you know, this is what peasants would wear. And his brush is very broad. It looks like a house painting brush with which he could just fling paint. On the other side, we have this tall, skinny, nude, figure. And of course, he's nude because uh, the neoclassicists, the academicians uh, would uh, favor uh, the uh, classical nude figures. Uh, and he's wearing a helmet that could be, you know, ancient Greece, ancient Rome. Uh, and his palate is held like a shield. And he wields not a spear, but a maul stick. Uh, and this is um, a tool by which you smooth out your brush strokes. Uh, it's a long stick on, 
On the end, there would be padded cloth or padded leather, and uh, the artist would, you know, stand back with this and smooth out his brush strokes. Uh, it's not an invention of the 19th century. There's a picture, for example, of Sofonisba Aguisola using a mall stick in the 16th century. But it's something, remember, Jacques-Louis David said, never let your brush strokes show. So this is how you remove your brush strokes. Now, there's also a reference to a famous work of art here. And so here you see where the spoof comes in. Uh, the academic painter is in the same pose as the Roman warrior in a neoclassical painting, Jacques-Louis David's Reconciliation of the Romans and the Sabines. And this was hanging in the Louvre, in the museum, so you know anybody could go and see it, so uh, people would catch the connection between these two. Uh, the Roman is holding up his shield, which has the uh, she-wolf nursing Romulus and Remus, uh, in the same position that our academician has his palette. And of course, uh, he's uh, going to throw a spear rather than a mall stick. Uh, and he also is in the nude, but with ideal perfect proportions. Um, the subject of the reconciliation of the Romans and Sabines uh, is um, a kind of follow-up to the rape of the Sabines. And it's uh, one of those stories of early Rome. Um, you know, Rome wants to, the Romans want to found a great city, but they have a problem. They don't have any women. So they asked the neighboring Sabines uh, to let them marry their daughters. And the Sabines say no. And so the Romans have a party. They invite the Sabines and then and then the signal is given and they each grab a woman to be their wife. Well, years later, the Sabines have been practicing war and they get their act together and they think they're able to take on the Romans. So they come to start a war with the Romans. Well, by this time, their daughters uh, have had children by their new Roman husbands. And they don't want their brothers and fathers killing their husbands or their children. They just sort of plop themselves down in the middle of the battlefield and say, make peace. And since the war is over the women, it doesn't make any sense just to kill them, you know, in the middle of the battlefield. So they're forced to make peace. So this is their uh, reconciliation and how the Romans got their brides. 